Hi, my name is Danny Doming. I'm a general dentist in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I'm going to lecture on the restorative revolution for full upper arch. Basically, just a digital step by step protocol for full arch, angulated screw channels, and 3D printing, milling, hyperdent, exocad. Let's get into it. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Implant Diplomat, and also check out the Facebook group Implants in Black and White. So, this is the I developed the F Vortex Full Arch Angulated Screw Channel Screw, right? Um, I've used several screws in the market, saw the flaws with them, and eventually I was able to work with a couple a team of engineers to come up with the current screw design that we've been using for the past four years and had great success with it. Recently teamed up with Rode Dental Lab to create the Grammetry Power by Vortex Screw for your arches, and we'll talk a little bit about the OptiSplint protocol and the the vortex screw with grammetry. So, but be, be, before I want to want to talk about the the desk screw. So, the the desk mini screw, the Noble Bio Classic mini screw, the small micro screw that we used to use. Um, you would only whenever you would use these for full upper arch because they were used for full upper arch. You would have 0 0.4 millimeters of material underneath the screw head, but you would engage four turns into the multi abutment, which is important. So, whenever you screw a screw into a full upper arch. It would actually, whenever it torques down, you need four turns inside the multi-unit abutment to be able to rigidly fixate and prevent the screw from backing out, prevent the screw from loosening. It's like I know people have heard screw loosening is an issue. You just need the minimal amount of turns, which is four, to get enough preload and clamping forces to be able to hold down your full upper arch and prevent the screw from backing out. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but just to introduce that concept now. Again, the issue is not enough material underneath the screw head. You would have 0.4 millimeters of material and eventually it would fracture. The other issue I have with the screw is it is a butt joint screw. The head of the screw is 2 millimeters. The threads are 1.4, but you only using 0.25 millimeters of radius of this screw head to hold down the full upper arch. That's not enough material and that's a lot of pressure on this screw head and eventually you would have fractures of the screw, right? Um, so let's get away from that. And then we, desk, so this is the, on the left picture is the, the mini screw and this is the longer screw. So this was like the answer to all of our problems to be able to create a longer, taller screw where you could get more zirconia and prevent the fracture of these upper arches. Now the issue with that is this screw, um, even though it was taller, I like this idea where you put more zirconia. So this is basically the multi-unit abutment here. This is the screw head. So this is the amount of zirconia you would get underneath the screw head. And it's 1.4 millimeters is, is the exact amount which you would get underneath. And to demonstrate that a little bit more for us is our colleague Horse who invented the eye metric. He's going to give a little talk about the different screws. That's the geometry that would be used if you use this direct, yeah? And uh, 34, that's what it looks like for the tie base from this. And 36 is basically the same with the library from us. We use the same screw. And 42, this is this long screw. So on 32, you have like 0.4 millimeter space between here and the air. So you have 0.4 millimeters of printed material. And that simply rips too easy. And with 42, you have like 1.4 millimeters. Yeah? And that gives you a lot more space. And, and a lot of people use that. And they simply buy the longer screw from this and all the design and everything is, is existing here. And then Rosen, he developed the, the screw, which is sort of conical and works with, with the friction of the whole head here, yeah. So basically he was talking about, this, this, this video is an old video, but this is the 34 is the desk screw with this tie base, right? 32 is the desk, same desk screw, but without a tie base. Right, so this is the zirconia. You're saying 0 0.4 millimeters underneath the screw head. So they came out with the 42, which is 1.4 millimeters, which he was saying was much, much, much better. And he was saying then, then recently, or this was, again a while back, because Dan Rosen's screw's been out for a long period of time. But this is the this screw holds down from the lateral wall. So this is a butt joint screw. This is 44 is uh, holds down from the lateral walls. You can see 0 0.2 millimeters of radius for a butt joint isn't as great as more walls of retention of your screw, right? So I hope that concept rings clear. This is the Dan Rosen screw for full upper arch. This is actually his original design here, but um, he was smart enough to thicken up the screw to prevent fracturing of the screw head because he, he knew there was a lot of tension on the screw. Um, so this was his screw. He talks about how this 
holes down from the lateral walls. This technology and this technique and this screw and this concept have been out for a long time in Prosto. So this is not a new concept for us. Um, Dan was just smart enough to, you know, get a patent on it for a full arch. So again, the mini screw would cause some fractures of zirconia because there's not enough thickness. So pr to prevent the thickness issues, we're holding down from the lateral walls, right? But he's also saying you can't torque these out. You can only use hand torque pressure to put these in. Um, but it wouldn't give you angle correction, so you couldn't mill angulated screw channels. There was a screw that came out with the ability to, mo to mill angul angulated screw channels, right? And it was a taller screw, but again, it went back to the butt joint where the, the screw was holding down the apex or the bottom of the, of the screw. The other issue I had with this screw is that the final drill for the hyperdent profiles is using a two millimeter diameter um, screw to be able to mill that out and that would weaken the zirconia and you have these really big fat holes to be able to fit the screw through and you can see these are really massive holes compared to these holes so this is the screw that I came out with the vortex screw for full upper arch you can see how tiny these screw holes are compared to this screw now there it this is the weakness of this full upper arch in all the, these screw holes so the more zirconia, can you imagine having a, a wide two moment around this hole right here? It's just it's gonna fracture, there's no way it can hold up. So you have to make these big and beefy whenever you use this screw. And on this one, you can have them a little bit more delicate or look a little bit more like natural teeth. If, even if you wanted to go FP1, that'd be conceptual. So obviously the market was moving over to angulated screw channels for full arch. Um, and Des came out with a concept to mill a flat surface at an angle. It is very, don't ask me, ask your lab tech if it's easy to mill a flat surface at an angle and you'll get your answer. Um, you can only go up to a certain amount to be able to get this predictably and it's still very difficult to do. So, and then this is the, this is the vortex screw. So this is the vortex screw and this is the, the desk tall screw, right? You can see the height of the screw compared to the height of the screw, right? So you, underneath our vortex screw, you have more material just like the desk long screw, right? Just a compare, comparison analysis. And then this is just the mini screw versus the desk long. So you can see 0 0.4 millimeters of material at the screw head, four turns, but this is 1.4 actually, or 1.2 underneath the screw head and 0 0.25. But the 0 0.25 radius is still a killer for me in these butt joints. Um, if you wanna learn more about the vortex screw, this is the screw here. This is the 1.4 and the 1.6. Click on this link right here with your phone. You'll be able to watch a free video that'll take you to a YouTube channel. And it's about a five minute video to kind of go in depth of the advantages of the screw. But this is the screw here and this is this is it. So it uses a T5 head and it's got this hyperbolic head where you can hold down from the lateral walls and the apex of the screw and be able to mill, be able to mill from angulated screw channels. Now the, what, what we perfected was, so, so we drew this screw in some software, we had a machine, we tested it, we drew our ExoCAD profiles, and we even drew the hyperdent template to be able to mill these things. Because what I wanted to do in, in, the, in the marketplace, whenever you're milling these things, you get some really loose tolerances with milling, and I didn't want to have a screw going down a hall. You know? um, what I wanted is a very tight tolerance. Now this is a very predictable milling profile for hyperdent. So we have a template generator that we created for this. So if you use this vortex screw and you import the vortex geometries into your hyperdent library, every time you take a full upper arch and you import it into hyperdent, those calculation tool paths to be able to mill it, it'll automatically recognize the screw and it already had pre-calculated tool paths. So the calculation times are gonna be faster and the results of your milling are gonna be tighter and better as long as you have the, the template generator. And if we can provide that for you if you ever need, just reach out. If you're gonna mill in your, in your office or if you're gonna use work with a lab that uses these, most major labs have the template. If they don't, they can reach out to me and I'll give it to them. So we have three different screws. The 1.4, which is the Noble Biocompatible screw for these arches. The 1.6, when the, one, the only difference between the 1.4 and the 1.6 is the radius is 1 .1, 0 0.1 millimeters wider here and here. So 0 0.2 millimeters overall for a diameter. Um, and this is the Riddle Dental concept. They came out with the first one. 
and um, and a couple of manufacturers got on the market and started using these. So you can also mill both of these for angulated screw channels, for direct multi abutment using tie base and direct and for uh, zirconium titate substructures. And we're coming out with a 1.72, which is the implant direct screw. This is soon to hit the market, hasn't yet fully. Again, this is a driver. So this is our T5 driver and this is our screw. And this is an angled tool path channel for a FP1 crown, so a single tooth crown. Um, this is our head. You can see it's a lobular shape and form. And you can see how it, the growth of it. So this is the apex of the screw and these are the threads. And then this is the bottom of the head, so right here. And then you can see as it tapers out to get to the top part of this screw head, that's this outer diameter here. So you can see it's a gradual curve out, like a hyperbole. It goes underneath and then out. And this is how it holds down the lateral walls of the screw. Again, um, this is the T5 driver. So it's a ball-in T5 driver is used to torque these out. Very compatible, with, exactly compatible with the Megagen any ridge. Um, Noble, just to note, Noble BioCare is a T5.5 um, and Strom is actually a T6. So um, for those who, that need to know that information. This is the T5 driver, and this is the tight tolerance of that screw. And this is a very predictable, even with tool wear, you can predictably mill these angulated screw channels and direct channels. So this is a direct mill, and this is a angulated mill at 22 degrees. And you see it was 1.4 millimeters of material underneath the screw channel, thick enough um, to prevent fracture of your zirconium. Um, just a quick little chart to show you the all the different features of all the different screws in the market and we basically tried to research and figure out what was the best screw and that's what we came up with but we wanted to be able to mill direct to multi-unit abutment so your full zirconia arch will sit on this multi-unit abutment and this screw will tighten into the zirconia cause clamping force and preload to be able to tighten up this arch and you can see we can milled at an angle and this screw can be used at an angle and it still unscrew this. It's a Torx head, that's all it is. I didn't invent the driver. It, I just used the Torx technology in the head of the screw to be able to develop this. Um, but um, what, I, what I did include is, so this, this driver is stainless steel and it's heat treated stainless steel. So it's, it's really very, very strong. But I did create a weak point on the driver. And the weak point is if, it, if you try to over torque the screw, sometimes you'll get screw fracture, right? Because the threads of these screws are only 0.4 millimeters, like it's gonna fracture. You can't over torque these things to 35 Newton centimeters like you can with a 1.8 screw. Um, so what I did wanna happen is somebody torque out this screw, it fracture into the multi abutment. you have this full upper arch that you've already delivered and it's catastrophic issues where you have to take out the upper arch, take out the multi abutment, replace the multi abutment, replace the arch, and then just have tons and tons and tons of issues. So instead of the screw fracturing, the driver will actually fracture if it, it'll break at, after 15 Newton centimeters. It's so much easier to replace a $40 driver than a whole upper arch and a multi abutment and all the components that go along with it. So just to, as a fail safe, these drivers will fracture or distort. Even heat treated stainless steel will uh, fracture. Um, then we also have the tie base interface where there's a lot of purists on the market that want an angulated screw channel but still want to use a tie base and we have that option to be able to use these tie bases with angle corrections. We can talk about um, cost of the screws compared to other screws on the market and the value you get out of each screw and Look, I've got a lot of money in this screw um, with a $50,000 patent, trademarks, um, software that I used to design it. You know, I had to, I had to buy 50,000 screws to be able to fulfill, um, just have like enough screws in the market. Like you can't go to somebody and say, hey, give me 10 screws and manufacture. They won't do that. You have to order a certain quantity of screws to be able to actually start selling these. So um, yeah, we're FDA compliant. Um, we have FDA 510K packaging requirements like we, we, we've done all of our homework for this screw but just understand I'm not gonna retire on this screw the screw is I'm not gonna make millions of dollars off of dentist on this screw if you want to buy 10 screws um, yeah it's gonna cost you you know 30 bucks a screw but if you want to buy 
a massive volume of screws and you want to incorporate the screw and you're doing a lot of full arches, then yeah, you're going to get, you don't need that much support from me and you don't need that much help from me and you're going to take off to the races. So yeah, you get a massive discount whenever you buy more of these, right? So you can get them for very inexpensive compared to other screws in the market, right? That's all I'm trying to say with that. Um, all right, so the, the concept that we talked about is direct to multi unit abutment, so without a tie base, with a tie base, with angulation corrections if you want, and any type of suck structure you want. You can use titanium, chromium cobalt, um, trilor, preet, whatever you want to use, you can use that as your, your, your substructure, and you can have a super, superstructure on top of that, whether it be composite, milled PMMA, or zirconia. And I'll show you some case examples in a little bit. But all of these can be milled with, without a tie base and with a titanium bar at all angle corrections, 15 degrees predictably. You can get up to 20. It just depends on your milling profiles and the, all the angulations of your arch. So we always say just 15. 25 with the angle tie bases and 25 degrees with the titanium bar substructure. So again, direct to multi abutment, straight and angled. Tie base, straight and angled and custom titanium full arch bars straight and angled you can actually mill an angled screw channel in these titanium bars and i'll show you some examples of that in a little bit but the screw just know that the screw holds down from the lateral walls and the apex of the screw head and you have 1.4 four millimeters of material underneath the screw head um, for your your full upper arches what you need so let's see 1.4 oh so that's the concept understand that you have three different materials that you can mill this in, not just direct to multi unit abutment, and you can angle correct. So you can angle correct in all three of these mediums, and you can go straight channels, but you can use it with a tie base, without a tie base, and with a titanium bar. All right, let's get into this next concept prosthesis types. So if you're FP3 and FP1, there's going to be a difference in the screw channel height all right because there's the, your crown's not going to be as tall as an fp3 so you're gonna have an fp1 crown right well that definitely changes your ability and what screws you can use for your full arch and I'll, I'll i'll get into that in a second i'll show you some examples let me just introduce this concept so what we've we've talked about is the 1.4 millimeters underneath the screw head of material of zirconia and at that, you have 4.25 turns, so a little bit more turns than you actually need. Uh, the minimum's four. You have 4.25, so you get a little bit more more turns, more attention, right? More fixation, pre preventing screw loosening. At 1.2 millimeters, so you can actually change. You can see that the depth of this screw compared to this screw, so it's 0.2 millimeters deeper in this. So now you have 0.2 millimeters of material underneath the screw, screw head, you have 4.75 turns. At one millimeter, you have 5.25 turns. So now you have one millimeter material underneath the screw head. And at 0 0.8, you have 5.75 turns. So more retention, more returns, uh, more turns into the screw. Now, why is this important? I'll get to that in a second. Just know that you have four different modalities to be able to change the height and the amount of material underneath. I don't want this people to lose this concept, but typically I use the 1.2 or the 1.4, and every once in a while I use the one millimeter, and I'll show you why. And what we talked about is clamping forces and preload. So this is the this is what preloaded. Preload is the tension created by the fastener, which is our screw when tightening. So pretend this is our vortex screw and it's squeezing down. This brown stuff is our zirconia. And down here at the bottom of the base of this is our multi-unit abutment. So as you screw down this screw into the multi-unit abutment, the threads engage the multi-unit abutment, and now they're pulling up the zirconia to the screw head, and that's where you get your clamping from. So the screw head to the base of the multi-unit abutment, and it's squeezed in between with zirconia. And that preload, that initial load that you put on the screw, that torque force of 50 newton centimeters will actually prevent the screw from loosening. All right. And again, you can mill that at various depths: 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4. And you can see the various. This is all the multi-unit abutment heights. And this is the base of the screw as it goes up. All right. So 
now what I'm going to do is show you a comparison of the desk screw on top of the vortex screw. So this is the desk screw, this box right here. You can see the, the diameter of the screw compared to the um, vortex screw. Now this is the this is what I got from ExoCAD. So basically this is the milling profiles. This is not the exact screw itself, but it's the milling profiles for the screw. So this is where the screw would seat inside the arch. So you can see that the vortex screw actually has more material underneath the screw head at 1.4 than the desk screw. You can see at 1.2, it actually has the exact same material. All right, and you can see that the one has a little bit less material. So 0 0.2 millimeters less material underneath the screw head. Again, just comparison the, the desk with the vortex screw, just to show you the material underneath the screw head. And this is one, and this is 0 0.8. And all this really becomes very important when you get into FP1 cases and small teeth, small mouths, where you don't want to have these big holes and you need angulated screw channels. But also, that's direct to multi abutment, but also what if you want to mill bars with angulated screw channels? Well, if you have an overdenture, it's really not that important, but you can mill angulated screw channels with these screws in this full arch bar. It's, it's what I call it, it's engineering simplicity, right? You want one screw for all of your cases, whether you're doing direct to multi abutment, are you doing tie bases, are you doing full up upper arch custom titanium bars? You want to grab one screw, you don't want to have 0 0.48, 0 0.5, or forget what screw you have, forget what driver you have. Don't have, you know, you can't have every single driver for every single system. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, but what if you have a full upper arch, right? Um, that's too big for zirconia. So the, the arch, the guy's mouth is so large and the teeth are so large, it doesn't fit in the puck. And, and in this case, this, this guy's got pterygoid implants. And he's got a massive mouth and we're doing second molars well i can't mill this whole arch in a puck this won't fit and he's a clencher and a grinder and i need some substructure or i'd like to have some substructure to prevent this thing from fracturing so then i'll introduce a titanium framework as my substructure angulate the screw channels out of the facial aspect if i need to to be able to get them out of this facial aspect so whenever I mill this full upper arch it'll have an angulated screw channel and I'll still be able to torque out um, each one of these multi abutments and again you can also use these with tie bases you can see this angle correction you can see how far out facially this this multi abutment is facing and it should come out the facial aspect of this implant but because I can angle correct the screw channel it's going to go down and in and actually to use tie bases and a bar for this case I did a combination of both so that's, that's the different features. Now let's talk about FP1. Now FP1 is a little bit more complicated when you're talking about screws. So this is the desk short that we talked about initially. This is the desk long screw. Now, see there's not enough material except for the 0.4. Again, we understand that concept. It's not feasible. So we could use the desk long, correct? Well look, this is a um, minimal thickness. So the minimal thickness of ExoCAD for this arch is going to bump out this. You see these little bumps for this FP1 case? So ExoCAD will be able to use this desk long to create this upper arch for FP1, but whenever you mill it, you're going to have these little bumps come out. And when you, after you mill it, you can actually shave this down in green state and then center it. But then once you center it and put it in the patient's mouth, these screw heads are going to be sticking out and you're not going to have enough material to put your Teflon and then your, your composite on top. These screws are going to stick out the arch. And this is the minimal thickness. So you can see the material underneath this desk screw. So this is not a very good screw to use for FP1. And in this particular case, this is what it'll look like. You'll get a bump out of, of zirconia because you need a proper thickness around the screw head because the screw is going to seat right here and then you put your material on top of here. But you can't have these bumps on your, upper, on your, on your arches. So this is just a comparison between the desk long screw. Now let's look at Rosen screw. Now Rosen screw is a very tall screw and you get the same effect with this screw, same minimal thickness effect. I'm going to show you the actual height of the Rosen screw. So this is the 
superimposition of both screws on, on each other. You can see that, that Rosen screw is a lot taller, especially here. And this is how it sit, they both sit in a multi-unit abutment. So this is the multi-unit abutment here. This is the material underneath the Vortex screw and the material that you would need to cover this screw and then the material on top of that to be able to put Teflon and flowable material on top. It's a very tall screw and very difficult to use for FP1. Same thing with this, this screw that we talked about earlier that can mill angulated screw channels, but the channels are really, really wide and in diameter because you use a two millimeter drill to cut out this orifice. Um, the screw is actually sticking out of the prosthesis, so not a great screw to use for FP1, right? And again, just a comparison side by side analysis. Yes, you get more zirconia underneath the screw head, but the screw head is way up here, right? So this is a, a superimposition of both of the screws. And again, the screw head of this other angulated screw, see how much wider it is? And the screw head comes out and goes all the way up here. So it's a big screw. So the Vortex screw is great because you can mill it at various angles, 0 0.4 or various depths, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2, and even 1.4. What if, what if 1.4 doesn't work for this one? Well, you can change that one. You can back that one out to 1.2. You don't have to change every single screw in the full upper arch. If, if 1.2 doesn't work, well, you can drop that down to, to one millimeter. Just change that one screw to one millimeter. Or you can change them all to the same depth. It doesn't really matter. But if you have one screw that's not, that's if you have a, a tight bite, a um, patient with a tight uh, interocclusal distance, small mouth, and you need to use a screw with an angulated screw channel, and you change the depths, this is the screw that you would need for that case. Um, and, and let's look at this case because this is kind of interesting. This is a full upper arch bar that we milled for this one guy. And it's neat because the full arch did not fit and he wanted second molars. So we milled the second molars inside the titanium substructure. You can see here, so this is a titanium substructure with second molars, angulated screw channels using the vortex screw. So you can see a second molars in the lower arch and he wanted them for the upper arch. So this bar gets milled separately from the zirconia that gets stacked on top of it and it gets centered and he gets second molars that can fit. He's just a really big man. And this is just a quick video to show you how to angulate the screw channels um, whenever you go on direct to multi unit abutment and I'll show you a little video how to use it. Um, you basically just deconstruct the parts and you change the, the screw channel angle and you can actually just mill the screw channel angle at whatever angulation that correction that you need for your arches. And then now you can see the angulations of those channels. All right. And you can also do that for titanium bar substructure. So there's, here's a titanium bar, typical bar. And we can mill this at an angle. And again, you can mill through the titanium. And whenever you construct the final prosthesis, the superstructure that goes on top of that, the PMA or the zirconia, you can actually mill those angulated screw channels inside there. And it still seats the same. Now, for these titanium bars, you don't, you can change the depth. We use 0 0.4 millimeters because it's really all you need. You can change to 1.8. You can do whatever you want. Um, so that's really the concept. And that's why uh, grammetry and uh, OptiSplint has the market on full arch. Look, I have an iMetric. I love iMetric. But just last week, my iMetric went down because the, the dominoes were worn out and I get, had to get some overnighted. Well, the patient was sedated in my chair and I needed something. I called iMetric support. They were super cool about trying to help me. Worked on it for about a half an hour. Gave up. I have a, grammetry, a couple grammetry kits in my office. I, I literally popped in the guy's mouth. It took me like five minutes. I looted everything together. Got the patient out of the chair. He was able to come back the next day to get some provisionals, and I'll show you his case in a second. So grammetry powered by the Vortex screws. So every time you order a grammetry kit, you'll get some Vortex screws. You'll get a Vortex driver, and you can order these hubs if you want these hubs as well. And you can use a manual torque driver, like a hand torque driver, to be able to torque these screws out at 15 newton centimeters for your full upper arch. Now, how do you? What, what's the the grammetry kit, the Opti Splint? What does all that look like? So. If you buy a kit, this is what you get. You get all these Opti splints here, six screws, some handles, and frames. Basically, each one of these little Opti splints gets screwed into each individual multi-unit abutment, 
and you take these wire frames and seat them on top of this area and you loot it all together and this is kind of like your verification jig you can scan these in the mouse but it's not as accurate as scanning on a tabletop scanner so I do scan these in the mouse you don't have to but I do and I take them out to be able to stitch them outside the mouth using a tabletop scanner or you can just mail them off to your lab to get an accurate fit so this is the lower intro this is the lower pre-op so this is not my case I actually helped somebody restore this case but this is the intro this is the the lower arch I removed it and I scanned the tissue so my protocol for this case would be to to if this lady's vertical is correct scan her upper arch scan her lower arch like in the upper left photo and scan her bite left and right side bite and that would give me my my vertical dimension for her so be able to cross mount that I would remove her provisionals and now scan her tissue that gets cross mounted back now I opti splint and opti splint scan which you see here and then I'm able to redesign and reprint her a lower arch to try in and that's what you see here so this is just a side by side compare and analysis preoperative soft tissue scan opti splint scan again you can scan this in the mouth if you want to it's not necessary what's really important is that you get um, this scan on a tabletop scanner for more accuracy All right and you get that so in this and this is once I, I just tack it in the patient's mouth with a little bit of old composite and I'll unscrew it and then I'll just take a bunch of cheap jet acrylic and I'll just load that thing up so it do, I don't want this thing to move if any of those move it's not accurate it's not gonna be it's not gonna fit proper and all I did was just cross mount so I cross mounted the the opti splint scan with the provisional scan with the soft tissue scan actually this is the opti splint scan intraorally with the opti splint scan or the the gramature scan um, on the tabletop scanner and this is superimposition of all of them and this is superimposition of the provisional scan with the final design scan and the opti splint scan all in one so let's let's look at a patient case right so this guy comes in and he that's a smile that's an exaggerated smile so I usually take two photos smile and retracted but now I'm taking exaggerated smile just for this one reason here just to see if they show any pink and um, his case is unique because he has already six implants in his maxilla his front four teeth are decayed and he just needs those teeth out and needs to be converted we, we can't remove bone anymore because the implants are already in position we're really just here to convert him from natural teeth to 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 implanted teeth and take out his and we're gonna do the same thing for the top as we are for the bottom so my protocol for the case the case like this would be able to, to take these three photos just like this and then I take intraoral scan so I take an upper and lower intraoral scan and a bite scan and I do this if the patient is their COCR is correct if it's not correct then I take a CR bite I'll tell you I had lots of issues with bites whenever I think patients are in a stable occlusion and they're actually not so if I can tell that they're not I take CR bites if I'm unsure I take a CR bite and if I'm not able to get to the room I just have my task take a CR bite so I know that the condyle seats fully in our in the fossa and I'm getting a really good bite and I can recreate their bite in ExoCAD um, and this is the upper and lower scan um, this is just the from our medit scan and this is his bite before and after or before now we're gonna um, what we're gonna do is send all this information out to the lab and what the lab does is they take the photos of him and stitch it to his teeth and then his teeth get mounted on an articulator right I use a penitent articulator and make sure that I go through all lateral excursions to make sure this thing's mounted properly before I start my surgery my surgery is pretty easy for this case because the implants are already in but I'm gonna show you like the the walking through the concept for this case so um, you have to have common stitching points kind of like we did when I sh first showed you that the opti splint so I'm removing the crowns from these I have an intraoral scan of the upper arch that's already taken I'm removing the back teeth crowns putting in multi-unit abutments and scanning them with these six millimeter multi-unit abutments scan healing abutments I'll show you what those look like later on these are my favorite ones on the market they work really well for FP1 and FP3 they're just the best universal scan body that I've used so the calming stitching point for this guy you can use uh, fixation pins if you want to 
but I'm going to use his teeth as a reference. So his teeth are going to be my reference. So these four front teeth, these four front teeth are going to be my common points. Now, once I take these last teeth out, I'm going to recontour the tissue and the bone in this area to stay FP1 and prevent his pink tissue from showing. I'm going to reduce some bone and contour the bone in this area and take my final scan. All these can get cross mounted and cross stitched back. So I'll send this off to my lab and they're going to wax up his teeth right from his original scans. They're going to wax up his teeth and remount it and make sure everything looks good and send me the STLs and I'll just 3D print them. And I did that for his upper and his lower. So this is the day after surgery. It's the very next day. See, he's not even that swollen. But his lips are a little messed up from the day before the procedure. This is provisionals, before and after results. Just some side profiles of his before and after results. This is his Panorex before and after. And this we printed on a Sprint Ray printer, uh, a P. Uh, 55s the new printers with um, sprint ray on x tough at 100 microns and it took 35 minutes and then we can deliver this and that's the whole opti splint protocol which is great if you use an eye metric that's great too there's actually a library for this screw it's called the levy library uh, you can use 0.2 millimeter seat or whatever seat you want if you don't have this library i can send you a video on how to use it and send you the library itself or just reach out to Transcend Dental and ask them for it and they can give it to you. Um, yes, we are FDA compliant. Yes, we're registered. Yes, we have our supplier quality agreement. Yes, we have we manufacture an FDA approved facility. Um, all this is ensure supply of our quality for ISO. We have everything you need that's standard for, for whatever. Yes, we are trademarked. Yes, we are patented. All that's been done right I know I get this question asked ongoing nonstop and the reason why we came out with the the name vortex is because the milling pass this thing takes in the hyperdent just reminded me of a vortex and the name kind of stuck and ironically I was just in um, Sedona on um, my wife just turned 40 and we're in Sedona for her birthday and um, all I heard the whole time in Sedona was the vortexes of so Sedona it kind of made me crack up you can see how the this is the this is the drill pass, and it doesn't matter what material it is PMA or zirconia, but this is the pass the drills takes to be able to mill out zirconia, our PMMA. Just goes in, in all these concentric circles over and over again. Again, these are just these are template profiles. So I have all of this saved, and whenever we import a full upper arch, it calculates relatively fast. And I'm, I think I'm going to show you a quick little video on what that looks like. Let's see if I can get this thing to go. So this is this is hyperdent, and I think this is an angled mill channel. So when it first starts out, it'll mill from an angle, and you get further down, further down, further down. Let's see if I can speed this up because it's a long video. Just to show the accuracy of the milling and show how capable it is milling. And actually mill in there too. Another thing that, to note is, um, and then it'll come back and remill the top orifice of it to make sure it has everything. Now the the car, we use a carbide round one millimeter burr to mill this, and we also have a new T cutter burr that will actually mill from the cavity side into this area heel to make sure that you're getting everything out, and there's no preload screw screw impingement. And this is just another video of um, it milling direct to the multi abutment or sh with a straight change of sh no angles, straight. We do have hyperlint templates, so important. Get your lab to use those. So this is the one piece scan multi abutment healing abutment. It says it's a healing abutment for m your multi abutment, and it's also scannable. So you can actually scan this and use the library in ExoCAD to be able to. Um, calculate to be able to design your full upper arches right um, tie base technology has changed a lot very quick on this you know this these high slope profiles weren't very retentive enough so um, we made them more then we made them taller over time but this was causing fretting so then the 
the tie base that we currently use has a tighter tolerance with a taller interface and you can mill these at angulated screw channels. But what case problems have I seen? Well, I have seen some issues with these. I've been doing this for four years now. Um, you have to use the proper ExoCAD library to create these. So make sure you go to the web ExoCAD's website. It's a verified library. Download the library. It's free. You can have it. Um, you can't take, like I had a guy ask me in a course, hey, I have this case that I, I designed a long time ago. I really want to use your screw, um, but can I just replace the, the screws that I have in now with your screw? And the answer is no, because your full upper arch is designed and milled to fit that screw and that screw channel. Our screw channels are very, very tight, and there's a better tolerance for them, and you can mill them at angles, and there's a, and there's a seating for them that's proper. So now you can't switch out old screws with these new screws. Whatever screw you whatever screw you mill to, that's the screw you're stuck with. Like I had this case in the top right, actually had a guy reach out to me and he said um, he's having issues with my screw, um, and the designer used tie bases. So this is the desk tie base, and he said whenever he went to to screw in, it wouldn't seat properly, and he was frustrated. Well, whoever designed this case for this dentist um, used a different library, and it wouldn't seat. Um, so make sure you use the, the proper library for it. Or whoever's designing for it, use the proper library for it. Only use this torque wrench. This is the only torque wrench I use. Um, I had a lady that was using her implant handpiece motor to torque out the screws and fractured off a couple screws. That was a problem. Um, broke a couple drivers. Um, for the screws, I use, I use the screws over and over and over and over again in my provisional phase. So every single tent that I use, I usually do temp two temporary, sometimes I'll do three, depends on the case. Um, but I'll always reuse those screws over and over again. But for the finals, when you're going to finals, I always use brand new screws for the finals. Again, hand torque with a driver to 15 Newton centimeters. Do not use anything motorized. Um, I am coming out with a delivery and a retrieval tool that is, is very friction fit and it'll hold the, the, the screw in the driver, or the driver in the screw. Um, you can get severe angles if you want to. One, p, one, screw for all of, uh, one screw for all of your cases instead of multiple screws. That's really what I wanted simplification for my life and my full arches and for the rest of my career. Um, printed arches, which, what I'll see a lot of times is you'll print an arch and you'll get a little piece of resin inside the screw access hole. Um, and when you cure it, the, the screw will bind prematurely. So I take a two millimeter round or, two, or three millimeter round burr and I'll just drill out that screw channel, clean it out, and I'll be able to bring my, my screw to depth. Um, that's, for, that's for printing. Um, for milling, contact Follow Me North America Hyperdent. They have templates that we created for the screw to get really tight tolerances. But for FP1, this is what I want to do. I want to use FP1, change the heights of my multi-unit abutments, and not or change the heights of zirconia underneath my multi-unit abutment, and get really predictable results, and get really nice tissues, and not have to mow down bone. Like this lady had a really high smile line. I wanted to give her a pretty smile, um, and I wanted to stay FP1, and I didn't want to mow down her bone. All right, what else? What about cases where you know you got a Terry going off here? Are you, you? This is my canine, so this is my first bicuspid, and this is my like third molar back here. Um, well, this is a long span for zirconia, not expecting it to fracture. And um, for these, if if I have long pontics, um, I'll add a titanium substructure into my arch, and I still want to be able to mill angulated screw channels. So this is a good reason be able to use this screw and be able to mill a titanium substructure for your arch. All right, and this is the case that we delivered for him, his upper and lower, before and after results, right? And it's a long span from this, this tooth all the way to the back. So this is the canine premolar all the way to the back here. It's a long span and not to expect a fracture, so I put a titanium substructure in there to prevent it from fracturing. I'm running out of time here, so I better speed it up a little bit. What about a, a patient that you had that you did teres, zygos, and an anterior implant? You have long spans of pontics. You're going to need a titanium substructure of some sort. I mean, these implants are not spaced appropriately like we're, we're commonly used to. The zygos are 40 millimeters all the way traversing lateral sinus to the zygoma. Again, shout out to Dan Holtzkoff who, who wrote 
a, a wonderful book on pterygoids and zygomas. Definitely check it out. But you can see the prosthesis is very tall because she's she lost all of her maxilla. Um, and there's no puck of zirconia that's taller than 35 millimeters. So I couldn't even fit her arch in a puck. So what did I do? I created a titanium substructure and I cemented her zirconia into the titanium substructure. So I get it. I got strength from the titanium, decreased the weight because I wasn't as much zirconia. It was less expensive zir zirconia puck I needed to use because the, the thicker the zirconia puck, the more expensive it is. There's definitely less chance for distortion during centering on a smaller puck. And there's greater flexibility on milling angulated channels through the titanium and the zirconia. So this woman, this is her before and after result, and this is her upper arch, and this is her smile. I mean, the, the upper arch goes all the way up to her nose. That's how much maxilla she lost. This is her before and after results. Her tissues, look at the long span here. And this is this titanium substructure. You can see it here, in these images. I mean, this is gonna last her for the length of time. And I also started, I'll go through the last couple of slides quickly because I'm running out of time. So the main reasons for using titanium structures are greater than two ponics, kind of like an all on four situation, extreme bruxisers, I want to get more rigid support. I also have affordability issues with some patients in South Louisiana. So what I started doing was milling titanium substructures and milling PMMA, like you see on this case on the, on the bottom right. That's milled PMMA on top, cemented with a resin cement. This is a very, very, very strong, full arch for this patient. Um, and you know, later on, if if she wears out the PMMA teeth, I just remill PMMA teeth and cement them onto the titanium bar. Or if later on in the future she says, you know what, I'm tired of PMMA, I want to go zirconia. Well, now I just mill it in zirconia and cement it onto the titanium substructure. So these titanium substructures are really, really awesome, and it, they're not difficult to work with. Um, and I, a lot of times I need strength from my full upper arch, right? And sometimes the size of these people's arches are so big, it's just not going to fit in zirconia puck. And that's when titanium comes to the rescue, right? So this is a case I delivered for this patient here, her upper and lower arch where we did PMMA. And she's an older female. She didn't want to pay for zirconia. So we made her a cheaper PMMA option that she loves and she's happy. Um, this is the arch I showed you guys earlier in the ExoCAD drawing. These were the, the two um, second molars that wouldn't fit. So they're milled into the titanium substructure. This is the superstructure of zirconia. And this is that big old guy in, in, in his mouth. And this is a smile. This is it seated, fully torqued out. This was the drawing that I showed you earlier. I really should probably stop the webinar right here. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ro, for having me.